this point of the course, we've come to a crucial understanding that I need to make explicit before we talk about Dworkin and what his unique contribution is to this debate about the distribution of wealth and how it should be distributed among members of society or whether it should be distributed among members of the society. And that is that all of the people who have been debating in the modern scene from Adam Smith on have seen that the crucial thing that we all have in common as a value in this debate is justice. Now you might say, yeah, well, everyone also has this concern for other people. When we ask how can we make a society that maximizes prosperity for everyone, then we're also bringing in the virtue of benevolence, aren't we? But you must see that benevolence presupposes, as we saw, liberty. In other words, you cannot be forced to be benevolent. And thus, to force someone to be benevolent is to be unjust. And so therefore, the virtue of benevolence itself assumes justice. And so really what has happened in the debate of what should I do with my money and what should society force me to do with my money is that we've really come to a conflict in conceptions of justice. So on the one hand, we have people like Adam Smith and free market economists who argue that the central concept behind justice is liberty and that any concept of government or government policy that restricts liberty is unjust. But on the other hand, there are those like the Marxists and other more regulated advocates of more regulated schemes of government and economic distribution like Marx. We see that they emphasize that justice requires equality and that any market scheme or scheme of wealth distribution that does not respect equal concern for all of the members of society is unjust because it's unfair. And so what we see is this conflict really, and, and this conflict comes out in modern America. Don't, don't fool yourself. This is a conflict between two schemes of justice. You might say conservatives advocate the more Adam Smith idea of justice, that justice requires liberty, and that liberty will sometimes come in conflict with equality. Whereas you might, and that when they come in conflict, you must err on the side of liberty. But then you might say the more progressive liberals, the democratic scheme, says no, the most essential point of justice is equality, and that when there's radical inequality in society as a result of too much liberty, then we must curtail liberty in favor of equality to preserve a just distribution of wealth. And so thus what you see is a lot of the conflict that has come down to us in our political debates about economic justice and the wise and moral distribution of money and wealth really come down to, you might say, two concepts of liberty that seem in conflict. Now you might ask yourself, well, why are they in conflict? Well, think of it like this. If I think of liberty as being able to do what I want to do, right? sometimes I want to do things that result in me earning more money than other people or me gaining more power than other people. And therefore, as a result, if liberty is not curtailed, then the, the decisions, individual free decisions of people, will lead to an inequality of distribution, won't it? But on the other hand, if the key is, I must preserve this equality of distribution, then I'm going to have to limit the decisions of people. And so that's why they seem on the surface to be in conflict with each other. So if these are two fundamental presuppositions about justice, and they seem to be in conflict with each other, then it might seem that we just throw up our hands and say, well, how can we ever rationally solve this problem? And that's where people like Dworkin 
and Rawls, John Rawls, and Habermas in Europe have come up with something which they think will solve this problem and make debate, rational debate, possible. In other words, look, when there's a conflict between positions, you have two choices. You either find a common ground that they both agree on and then show how the one side um, support, is supported by their common ground more than the other side, okay? Or you stop the discussion because if there's no common ground, they both lead to, their different grounds lead to different conclusions, then it might seem that you should be a skeptic and say, okay, <laughs> there's no way to solve this problem. But people like Dworkins and Rawls and Habermas, they argue that if we were to take this debate to a ideal rational dialogue level, then what we would try to do is see if there is a common ground and see if this common ground is able not just to favor one side over the other, but show how both sides could be balanced with each other and not be in conflict with each other. This is called coherence. And Dworkin is one of the most famous examples of a coherence person, a person who believes that when there's a debate, if you're ideally rational, you must believe there's a right answer and that when there seems that there's a conflict, that skepticism is not an option. Why is that the case? Well, think about an ideally rational debate or deliberation. Let's say I'm for abortion and you are against it. And I say abortion is completely okay, it's completely permissible. But Jody says, no, abortion is always wrong. And then there's a third position, right? The third position is, well, it's not either always wrong or always right. It should be left up to the choice of the individual. But then you might have a fourth person come in, Dworkin says. And this fourth person could say, look, you're all wrong because you're all thinking in terms that there's a right answer to this question. There is no right answer to this question. We could never come up with a right answer because there's just no good arguments for any side. There's no moral truth. That's, let's call that the skeptical position, that there is no right answer. Dworkins very rightly says this. Isn't that also a claim about who's right? Isn't the skeptic also claiming that, that Jody and all of her arguers are in fact wrong? They're all wrong in thinking there's a right answer. And that really, skepticism is the right answer. But do you see the contradiction there? If skepticism is the right answer, then even the skeptic is claiming that they are right, and therefore that there is a right answer. And so in a rational deliberation, there is no global skepticism. You can't have it. You have to assume that there is a right answer because even the position of skepticism is claiming to be right in the discussion. And so if we would all start, people like Dworkin and Rawls said, from this ideal position, which isn't real, this hypothetical position, which sometimes people like Rawls will call an original position, i.e. a position where no individual circumstantial factors are brought in, only the ideas and people who are ideally rational and ideally competent to deal with all the issues are just put in a room and allowed to discuss, what kind of answer would we come up with about justice? Dworkin says, is there an answer that actually takes these two seemingly contradictory notions of justice and makes them coherent so that I can accept both? He says, yes, there is. And that this idea that's foundational to every single concept of justice, if worked out clearly, will lead to a position that allows us to have a maximally just society, which is, in one sense, maximally liberal, i.e. allows maximal freedom to all the members of society, 
and also maximally equal. In other words, shows equal concern for all members of society. In our next video, we will look more specifically at how that gets worked out.